Hey, hold up, hold up, bro. Man, you didn't hear? What? Squeezify's out. Who, Squeezify's out? Bro, 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 hold up, hold up. Please, you can't go. Bro, I, you, you know I would take a fender bullet to the heart for you. I got a family to feed, man. I'm so sorry, dude. Jay, Jay, you can't go. Hey, rumor has it there's a cruise ship gig down in New Orleans. Whole band's got trumpeters flu. Maybe I can catch a break. Hold on, Pat. No, no, no. Now you two. Come on, bro. Bounce, on the one. Oh, ba 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 is Corey in the Wong notes. Now today's show is gonna look a little bit different than normal because we lost our sponsor and the entire band quit, but I'm gonna get through it. I've got a plan. Why? Because today's episode is actually now all about DIY. Do it yourself. Any true DIYer knows though, you don't do it all yourself. So I've got my sister-in-law Charlene over here on the camera. Char Charlene. You don't need to move everything. And I've got my little nephew, Brantley, over here, <laughs> helping out as a stagehand. Throw up on the floor. <laughs> Brantley, <laughs> hey bud, if you're gonna be on the phone, at least just do it over there. This is the part of the show where I would normally do a monologue or go into some fancy transitional sketch, but if I'm being completely honest, I've been a little overwhelmed lately with trying to recreate the set and the band. And Speaking of losing my sponsor and needing some money, I'm gonna transition us into a brand new segment I like to call Corey's Craft Corner. <laughs> All right, come on in here. Let me show you this. Squeeze if I squeeze me out in my striped t-shirt game. So what have I been doing? I've been spending the last two hours making my own striped shirts, not only for myself, but also for you, my fans, that you can buy. Small paintbrush, blue paint, consistent spread, you get the ruler out. Crap! Can I get some new top? Brantley, I need new brushes. You want some little figurines? I got you! Got the Steve Strandana. Got this figurine. Comes with the gold trumpet. Sick! Check out Michael Nelson. Got the horn charts. And the, uh, I guess, the French horn. Got the acoustic guitar on mine with the striped shirts. That's a custom job. 35 for this one, 30 for the regulars. Hey, what's up, Michael? Hey, man, just chilling, you know, doing some horn arrangements this weekend. Hey, well, uh, you know, I got this thing that I'm doing, uh, this, you know, acoustic duo. Do you think you could maybe do some horn shirts? Oh, man, there's not enough time. Uh, oh, Kenny Holman, check it out. Hey, look, guys, I can play giant steps on a McDonald's straw. Hey, hold up. Brantley, where's my KG on the B3? That was my biggest one. I spent like eight hours on that. I was gonna make 50 bucks on that thing. Apparently, did you see the keyboard thing? No. What are you doing, by the way? Nothing. Where is the mic? What? Oh, oh. oh, oh. oh my God. Hey, Corey, Bela Fleck is here for you. Today? Oh my God. Hey, can you quick just put the set back together? I gotta run to this interview. Well, Sorry, hello. I'm late. <laughs> Appreciate you letting us use your house for this. My pleasure. One, two, three.
just need to write one hit song. You know what I'm saying? You will, man. You will. Anyway, let's go eat some of this freaking cake. All right. One, one, hit, one song. hit song. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Oh, is this one of your songs? No, it's happy birthday. Wait, ha you wrote me a song for my birthday? Oh. How fun. Oh. Well, don't let us stop you. Keep going. Happy birthday to you. Okay, yeah, yeah. You seriously don't know the song, Happy Birthday? Got nothing. It's kind of a simple melody, but I'm sure it, it builds to something really good. Yeah, yeah. keep going. Keep going. Yeah. Happy birthday, dear Steve. A little repetitive, but... We're okay. getting somewhere, we're getting okay. somewhere. Okay. Happy birthday to you. You seriously don't know happy... Wait, none of you know happy birthday? Is that where it, it ends, or? Uh... That's the whole song, well, four lines. Well, okay. That's the okay. song. None of you know this song? It's good. Yeah. Huh. It's good. Let's get the key. Oh, it's Let's careful with that thing, huh? Sorry. And uh, also, you know, we're trying to shoot the show here. Maybe don't invite all your friends around to hang out. No offense, Olivia. I'm taking it. Well, here's the deal. 
I'm trying to be a professional here, right? I try to run a professional operation. Boomer. Whoa, hey, boomer? I'm literally 20 years younger than your mom. Uncle Corey, just chill out. Have you checked your phone? What? You're going viral. On what? You're on TikTok, right? Yes, I have TikTok. Wait, what is this? What is this? That's my song. That's your song? Yes. The Trash Boomer song? I, I know this isn't the Trash Boomer song, but this is my song. This is the Trash Boomer song. I wrote song. this song. Oh my God, that song is awesome. Well, thanks, but what is this? As soon as I found it, I put it on a bunch of playlists. Went really? Cool. Yep. Those numbers are insane. Mm -hmm. Wait, hold on, hold on just a second. You want to tell me your uncle Dan? wrote the Trash Boomer? My old manager? What do you mean you're back? The sponsors are back on? The show's back on? Really? This is great. Not bad. It's a nice little backyard. I aspire to have a terraced backyard like this. Yeah, we have dirt, we have ants, airplanes, ticks. Yeah, it's awesome. I'm afraid of ticks. Yeah, you should be. Um, we had an armadillo the other day. You had an armadillo yeah, in your backyard? Yeah, walking around back here, yeah. Damn. Which apparently you can get leprosy from an armadillo, or they can carry it. Really? Mm hmm When is the last case of leprosy ever recorded? About 20 minutes ago. Did Jake get it from that armadillo? <laughs> I think you got it during that last take. I didn't want, I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> no. Dang it! Well, it no, is a lovely day. This is what we get with outdoors. This yeah. is, you know. You can go with it a bit. Sometimes a controlled environment is good, but also allowing yourself to be okay with things out of your control. Yeah. Now, how that translates to music, it translates in a lot of ways. The obvious one, just because we're outdoors. Yeah. You play outside in an outdoor amphitheater. Is the audience gonna ra get rained on and then you feel bad because you're the only one underneath Yeah, a, a, some covering? True. And is there some weird reflections from something bouncing off and all of a sudden there's this weird delay? What was that festival we played with Wolfpack? North Coast? This festival is awesome, by the way. It's in Chicago. But we were playing on one side of the festival grounds and the, on the other side of the grounds, there's this EDM artist that is blasting. Yeah. Like probably as loud as us for the audience. Yeah. So I could just see it on their faces, like what is happening? Right, what a bummer. They really wanted to but, hear you. They don't yeah. get to, yeah. So, you know, it's controlled environments. Yeah, so we should go back inside, is that what you're saying? No, 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 <laughs> I'm ready to receive some tick juice. Mm. In your creative process, when do you decide, I'm just gonna do this myself? And when do you bring other people in? And what are those people that you bring into your world? Well, you know, in pandemic times, everything changed. I have a great guy who's been working with me since 1982, I believe, Richard Battaglia, and he's a sound man. He was a sound man for uh, Newgrass Revival and, and Road Manager. And yeah. then when the Flectone started, he came on with us, and then he's worked with me ever since in everything that I've done, except when I play with Chick Corea, and he has his guy, yeah. you know, but mo almost all the time. And so he set up my studio and gets everything working. And so I've always felt like, okay, I'm gonna edit, I'm gonna do all this stuff, but he's gonna, I'm not going back, back there with the wires. I'm not gonna get yeah. down and try to figure out what goes into what, you know? I'm gonna ask him to do stuff for me. Well, come pandemic time, we have a kid who's a little higher risk, so Richard wasn't coming over anymore, and so now yeah. I'm back there, you know, doing it myself. And I've gotten, you know, passable, but it's always like a, it's not my best thing. Sure. <laughs> Let's just say. So it's always a holy mess in there. Yeah. But I get the job done. And I've learned how to, you know, with, with, with a banjo, you know, you're on mics. You're not yeah. on a DI and I'm not in a booth. So I have to go over, put the machine in, record, run back to my seat, put a bunch of pre-roll on, get the headphones on, tune up and do some takes. And I've finally learned how to do, um, you know, loop recording so I can do takes for a while just sitting there. And then I get up and I go back over and I hit stop. And then I've got all these takes and then I have to catalog them before I forget where everything is. Are you running to tape? No, I'm saying I'm, t I'm not not running a tape. I go to tape afterwards. I'm oh, okay. a big fan of, yeah. of a generation of analog uh, yeah. afterwards. So I go. Well, it I, sounded like your process. You were saying go to the machine. And yeah. Then... Well, I have to go over, hit it, run back, get my banjo out, and do it. And 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 then I've just when you loop record, you end up with all of these files, and sure. they're all you know virtually behind 
the track you're looking at and yeah. they go back into you know infinity if you play for an hour sitting in yeah. your seat and then you've got to actually go out and pull them all out pull them into playlists yeah and then if you multi-mix like a multi-track like i usually usually use at least three mics on my banjo mm. they don't all come at once so you've got to pull each one it turns into this just all this time soak stuff and yeah yeah, if Richard was here, he'd be doing all that. Yeah. But I am getting the job done. Yeah. You know, yeah. I get things done, but I get a little. But nowadays, it's like, oh, and you have to film your part, and you have to get the solo live on film. So now, I'm running over. I'm throwing it into record, turning the iPhone camera on, get running over, and I'm doing the takes, and then I go back and I have to figure out which take on the on the iPhone is the right one and send it to the. Because, you know, you want to play a, a take yeah. all the way through. Yeah, yeah, of course. Which, of course, you want to do. And so it, it just keeps on compounding more and more things. Is that fun or stressful for you? It's getting old. Really? It's getting old, yeah. Glad I can do it. Now I know how to do it, and I can do it. But sometimes there's just so many steps before you can actually play. And by the time you're ready to play, you're just not in the mood anymore. You totally. Do, you're, you're having a whole different mental game trying to figure out how to get it. Then you finally sit down, and you see the, com you, the computer has crashed, you know, after all the, all the steps. So... If we're complaining, yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. But yeah, um, but I'm lucky to have the gear. I'm lucky to have the instruments that I have, and and great music to work on. Usually, really fun stuff to do. We just played duo, yeah. and I understand why you shine in a duo setting from playing with you now, and also from listening to a lot of your records. You have a lot of duo albums out. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Is there something about the setting of just two people that's alluring to you, or is it just coincidence that you've done a lot of duo stuff. I certainly like it. Um, I think that, um, you know, Chick Corea doing duets with Gary Burton, always, I thought that was a really cool thing and realized yeah. it was, sounded very complete with just two instruments. Yeah. And then, I mean, the simplest co communication is with two people. The more people there are, the more, you know, things have to be right. It's yeah. just two people. Um, you just try to make the music sound complete. So, you know, if I was playing in a larger group, I wouldn't be playing as many roots and fifths. Sure. I'd be, be playing out on the extensions. But with just two... Like with me and Abby, for instance, it makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons for us to be able to go out and play as a husband and wife. So yeah. we just decided we're going to make this thing work. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And then playing with Chick Corea, you know, I don't know, the fact that he wanted to do it, that was good enough for me. And yeah. I was scared, but in a weird way, with just two of us, he had to take me into account maybe more than if it was a larger group. All of a sudden, they'd be playing some stuff I wouldn't know what was going on, mm. and I'd just be like, uh... You know, I'm not really a jazz musician, but with the two of us, we work out, you know, we figure out what we can both do well together. Yeah. You know, and, and there are places I can really go with him, what I could go with him when he was still alive, yeah. and places where it was just beyond my understanding, the language yeah. that he could play. But um, generally, if I couldn't follow, he would figure that out too and, and simplify it for me. Zakir is always, those, those are two guys that I play with a lot that I think of as being, you know, effortless masters. Yeah. They're using like, no effort. They're using 40% of their ability at any given time. Yeah. I'm using 70 or 80 just, just to <laughs> do what I'm doing. So they have a choice. Like they could like destroy you or they could be kind. And they're both very, very kind. And sure. one of the things also about Zakir is he's like, he could play as complicated as you can, but he won't play a bunch of stuff that's too complicated for you to respond to. He figures out mm. where you're at and then that's, and then he pushes you just a little bit yeah. rhythmically with the kinds of subdivisions and things that he can do. And Chick was kind of good about that with me, too. He's very kind. They're both yeah. very kind. Obviously, they're incredible musicians. You're speaking in a way where you're, you're humbly putting yourself in that situation, in some ways kind of almost referring to yourself inferior in this, in this way. Yeah. Well, I tend to play a lot of music with people that are, way, you know, that are expert at something that I don't do. Yeah. You know, and that's sort of my job is to like, see if I can pull the banjo into, let me see if I can play with the greatest jazz <laughs> piano yeah, player yeah. in the world and like <laughs> not be an embarrassment. And if I just make it okay, people are going to go, wow, I never thought the banjo could do that. And if mm -hmm. I suck, they're going to go, wow, the banjo really can't do that. So like Zakir, like trying to play Indian type music with someone like Zakir, who has been in his family, he's like one of the most revered Indian musicians yeah. in the world. Your humility just comes right up to the surface. You yeah, know yeah. what I mean? It's like, I'm not saying I'm not a good musician. I think yeah, I'm yeah, a real good musician. I'm yeah. really good at figuring out how to make stuff sound complete. Yeah. That's probably the best thing that I do is figure out how to make it sound, you know, something right about a combination. I can find a way to play the banjo that found, that makes it feel like it's supposed to be there. Probably more than any technical thing that I've figured out. It's that sure. making it sound at home in various idioms that um, I think, I think, you know, you're I think killing that's what that. I'm You're at. crushing that in a way where we talked off camera a little bit about this. I haven't had the chance to play with a lot of banjo players who are interested 
in doing this sort of thing, mm -hmm. in some ways removing what might be a stereotype or a, right. uh, a preconceived notion of what an instrument can do right. or what its function is supposed to be. Right. Where do you hear people do it wrong? A lot of times people try to play too much. Mm. Like I think when you're playing music that the banjo isn't typically in, you, you want to play simpler than you think you need to play. Sure. It's not like, oh, I better play all kinds of fancy stuff to show I can play fancy too. It's more like find a pocket. Like when I play with Dave Matthews a lot, that would be the thing. What, where can I play my root, my one five one uh, groove, and just lock into the pocket with Carter? Like just yeah. if I and look, if anything, just hold one chord while they all change. Yeah. You know, instead of trying to figure out how to, it, the, the song doesn't need a lot of busyness. Yeah. It's already packed with stuff. So, yeah. so a lot of times the banjo can be nodal point that everything's moving around. If you find mm. a, you know um, a pitch that you can just hold on to and play rhythmically. Yeah. Times. So I've, I like to do that droning. Yeah. Kind of stuff. Especially if the chords are interesting and they sound good against that one five. Yeah, and yeah. Make neat, neat tensions and stuff. Yeah. That's actually a, a big yeah. pop guitar move, too. Yeah. The root fifth thing. Yeah. And sometimes, like you're saying, it's just that texture. Yeah. I think also when people hear the texture of the banjo, that in some way already kind of does that thing for their brain. Like they might right. think that the banjo does one thing, but if you just hear that texture, the timbre of the instrument, fitting into the this tune that you're hearing or that yeah. you might already be familiar with, that is a cool way to make it just blend a little. So it's such a simple approach, but obviously it works. Yeah, I'm usually looking for some kind of a part that just makes, is useful to the song. Yeah. Not just about, you know, what how can I show off? Like, sure. Gen generally, I'm gonna get a chance to show off, and then I usually don't think very much about that part. Yeah. That's actually the hardest part, maybe the hardest part in a way. You would think the busiest, more complicated part, but that stuff you just kind of let it happen and try to yeah. get out of your own way. But in terms of finding a part that really feels like it made the song better, yeah, that's it's hard to do. The other thing I keep thinking about is that the banjo is a percussion instrument, and so I think if I can play really in a strong rhythm, mm -hmm. I always feel like I'm doing the song more good. Since we're talking about the banjo, imagine that we're talking about the banjo. I talk about it a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> seems to come up for some reason. <laughs> the history of the banjo is very interesting to me. I learned a lot from your ethnomusicology documentary, what, I, I, or your, your study of the history of the banjo and where it comes from, and then also trying to understand some of the history of bluegrass. Mm. And to me, when I, after watching your documentary, I was thinking about the history of the banjo and kind of how everybody thinks about, not everybody, the general public thinks about bluegrass mm -hmm. and how it maybe seems so far removed from its origins. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit for those who haven't seen the documentary, kind of what the history of some yeah. of the, the brief history of the banjo and how it intersected with bluegrass music and kind of what, what, what the genesis of that whole thing is? Yeah, well, perception has gotten skewed and people have a short memory as human beings. So bluegrass is actually much more recent than a lot of things with the banjo. So go before bluegrass, you have the banjo playing a part in Louis Armstrong's early jazz. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't say, "Oh, the banjo is a jazz instrument." Yeah, there's a reason for that. So um, before that, you have banjo orchestras playing classical and mu pop music of the day. Um, you have um, the banjo being played on the plantations by the slaves who brought over either the instrument or the knowledge of how to make one with them from Africa, and. Um, yeah, all that stuff comes way before bluegrass in the mm -hmm. timeline, you know. What happened was, so the slaves are playing the banjo on the plantation, and the white folks kind of notice that something kind of cool is going on, they start copying it. And then they start um, putting on blackface and performing in a style of music that was called the minstrel style, uh, which was, you know, white guys painting themselves black and performing music. And this music might be singing about, like, how great it is on the plantation working on, you know, on the on the plant. You know what sure. I mean? It's awful stuff. Yeah. Um, and it becomes very, very popular around, you know, like in England, the minstrel stuff. And the banjo is in jazz, you know, Jelly Roll Morton and Louis Armstrong are using it. And then along comes the guitar. I mean, the guitar is a latecomer, mm -hmm. but way, way later than the banjo totally. to the yeah. States. So all of a sudden somebody plays the guitar on a, on a jazz recording. And literally the next day, everybody said, I want that. I don't want that banjo anymore because the banjo for black people put it back into the slave days and it reminded them of the minstrel shows and all the stuff where 
which is very distasteful. So now yeah. they suddenly they had another option. Yeah. So the guitar got, you know, became the instrument of jazz, and banjo pretty much became a history piece from then on. Yeah. You know, um, so in fact, all the banjo players were out of work like within the, within the one year, you know, of, of being like working their butts off, all of a sudden nothing. And so Gibson invented an instrument for all of those guys called a tenor guitar. It was a guitar that you tuned like a banjo for them to make the transition on. And they yeah. sold all these instruments to banjo players who were out of a job. That's nobody wanted. why the tenor guitar exists? That's why the tenor guitar exists, yeah. And they tuned it like a banjo, and then these guys could go, could go play a gig. Wow. Nobody wanted their banjos anymore. It was just lights off, nobody. Then, meanwhile, Earl Scruggs comes along and knocks everybody dead on the, you know, on the Grand Ole Opry sitting and, you know, playing with, in Bill Martin Rose Band in yeah. the early 40s. And it's like a new life, because banjo was going downhill, it was going away. It yeah. was being played in old time music and in, in the mountains, but it was not a big thing anymore. And when Earl Scruggs showed up in, with this brand new high tech three finger style, all of a sudden it got very popular among a certain sect. It was like the Beatles um, playing on, on um, Ed Sullivan when, when Flatt and Scruggs played with Bill Monroe on the Grand Ole Opry with Earl Scruggs' new fancy banjo picking. Really? People went crazy. There's some recordings of it. You could probably find them yeah. if you dig around a little bit. It was that big of a deal it at was that a time? big deal. And that's the only reason that the banjo is still on anyone's radar, I feel. I mean, in, in really? the big way that it is right now, because without Earl Scruggs, um, making everyone pseudo fascinated with the banjo again, giving it a whole new life, and bluegrass becoming this very major form of, of American music, yeah. it was going down. So the problem is that every, you know, bluegrass is great. It's one of the greatest musical uh, things that America yeah. has come up with. It's just a little piece of the story. And it became so popular and so well known, it became, uh, that was all anybody thought the banjo was. Everybody mm. forgot about everything that came before. I mean, everybody, I'm talking about mass understanding or, or yeah. mass perception. And then things like dueling banjos came out. Sure. And there was he the Hee Haw Show. Yeah. And there was the Ballad of Jed Clampett, you know, the, the, the Beverly Hillbillies. And those things really cemented this idea of a sort of a southern white poor instrument. I'm fine with that. Um, I mean, like, in other words, I wouldn't be playing banjo if it wasn't for Earl Scruggs and that southern white yeah. side of banjo. But the story is just so much more interesting. There's so much more to it. Mm -hmm. And so going back to Africa for me, I knew all that. I knew I knew 90% of the people I was going to go play with, and I, was, I loved their music. I had had recordings I was playing along and learning from. And there was a lot of people I played with that I'd never met. But I didn't really learn anything new about that over there. I just got to see it in person. Yeah, but you also got to educate a lot of people because I didn't realize that the banjo was that deep. And I knew that banjo existed in jazz. I didn't even do the digging the step before, like you're yeah. saying, banjo orchestras. Yeah. And well, now hearing you, you say that. But why like, would you? You know, unless sure. you have some skin in the game, which I did, like I'm a Yankee, I'm from New York City, I'm playing banjo. I was like, why do you play bluegrass? You know, and I'm like, well, I don't know. I just like the banjo. I don't know. But the more I found out, the more I felt like I really do have a right to play. Of people playing the banjo in, you know, in the eight, late 1800s in, in New York City like crazy, playing all kinds of music. So the truth is when you look at the big picture, all of a sudden I make a little more sense yeah. than I did. So the, for me, I, like I said, I had some skin in the game. And I also felt like it was a maligned instrument, and I didn't. I'm a serious kind of guy. For some reason, I wish I was light, more light, but I'm not. And laughing at the banjo bugged me because yeah. I thought it was a great instrument. Yeah. I, I loved it. I thought it was badass. And people laughing and flapping their arms when I walked by while I was trying to be the best musician I could be mm. really put me off, and it kind of got my back up. And so I had something to prove. You yeah. Know? So uh, I was like, No, you can do anything on this instrument. You know, you yeah. can play. I'm going to figure out how to do it. I'm going to yeah. figure out and I'm going to show you. How I was old part were you the, when you first yeah. felt like, I've got something to prove? Well, I didn't start till I, I was 15. I was just starting in high school. Um, that's when I got my first banjo. I was playing a little guitar at that point, but I first, first so I was a late start. Pretty much, you know, as soon as I started playing, I was getting the, 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 the flapping arm stuff and the really? yeehaws and stuff. Yeah, because it was like just after dueling banjos. So this What was, part of the country did you grow up in? Manhattan. Under Street and West End. That's right. It was you yeah. telling me that you went to school with Marcus Miller and Omar yeah. Hakeem. I did, yeah, that's right. And Kenny yeah. Washington. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah, and Don Byron I was totally in my class. I forgot that you grew up in Manhattan. Yeah, that's okay, right. That, that, I guess that. So that makes it all, that, that, that's what I mean why, like, I'm never going to be from a cabin home on the hill, so it doesn't make any sense for me to be playing that music. I love it and I've tried. Sure. And I even moved to Kentucky so I could study, get much closer to Earl Scruggs and J.D. Crow and 
the people that really played that well in that part of the country. Um, but I was never going to become that, but I was going to be better. I wasn't going to be a Yankee banjo player, just a I wanted to have some of that sound and some of that feel sure. that the Southern guys had. Because it tended that folks like my teacher, Tony Trishka, or Bill Keith, or other great uh, New York players, there was a tendency for like incredible creativity, but maybe they didn't sound like the Southern guys in terms of the rippling groove that, that a J.D. Crow or a Scruggs could, could create, although they were fantastic players. I don't, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not putting down, but I wanted to, I didn't want to sound like a Northern player. I wanted to sound like yeah. those guys while doing Northern stuff. Yeah. So I was looking for a way to combine these two uh, different points of view. Because it seemed like the Southern guys, they weren't as creative. So, there's always some, some people sure. that were. Yeah, 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 of course. And then up north, there's always some guys with incredible time who played with yeah, that yeah. Southern field. But the tendency was towards a much bouncier style up north and more straight eighths. You know, Daddy Crow played more of a straight. And it grooved in a whole different way. Yeah. Instead of going dingy, 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 it was digga, 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 digga. You know, it was like, yeah. you know, it was neat. In all styles of music where there's something, where there's purists, mm. right? There's jazz purists. There's, you can go to New York and find a circle of people where the only jazz that exists to them is 1940s yeah. jazz. I'm certain that there's that sort of thing in bluegrass. I've talked yeah. to people that are only into traditional bluegrass, people that are only into traditional country and hate modern country. Yeah. They went through that in the 90s with 90s country and that sort of thing. As bluegrass has progressed as a genre, do you feel any tie where you have to teach or show what the, like with your new album, do you feel the responsibility to take bluegrass to a new place or do you feel a responsibility to show the real roots and authentic history of the genre? I wanted to take it to a new place while showing the authentic roots of the genre. That so was my goal. how do you do goal. that? Well, I guess it's hard to say some stuff without feeling like I'm being negative about the younger players, but I always notice that usually pro progression appears to be people playing faster and busier and, and more, more, you know, more technical ability. Uh, but then you listen back to some of the older guys and you're like, wow, there's something that the young guys don't have. Sure. You know what I mean? And now that I'm turning into an older guy, I'm maybe my hands are slowing <laughs> down, prizing some of those things that I know that I have, um, that I learned yeah. you know, from some of those, those guys. And that when I hear some of the newer players, I'm like, well, I wish he had some of that because then it would be a whole other thing. You know, there would be that depth. With my records, I've made uh, two bluegrass records in all this time. And one was called Drive, one was called Bluegrass Sessions. And they were important records for people. They, yeah. Because the, everybody, it was new music, but it was more rooted than you know, it was impossibly greatly rooted. Yeah. Because it was Tony Rice and Sam Bush and yeah, Jerry totally. Douglas and Stuart Duncan and Mark O'Connor and all, all those guys do have that. They're modernists, but they are rooted like crazy. Sure. So as they get replaced, sometimes they don't get replaced by as many people that have that rooted quality. Yeah. You know, as they age out and the new people come. With this record, um, I explored a lot of the younger players and the older players. Yeah. Um, and I tried to write material that had a real connection to the old music, but that was f moving forward. Yeah. So for me as mostly a rhythm section player, somebody who lives in the rhythm section, I love rhythm yeah. guitar, that sort of thing. I have studied kind of the history of time feel and how mm -hmm. time feels have come up. I'm a grid kid. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the grid generation. Sure. Probably one and a half generations before me, it started being more of a thing. But now it's like every one of my peers, we grew up on the grid. Right. But of course, we've listened to tons of music that wasn't recorded on the grid, and you and I could play together like this, not on the grid, and it still is great. But there's definitely a, a thing in more of the music that I play now that's much more right. feeling right on the center and feeling like the time is constant. Is there something like that that exists in the bluegrass world? Is that? Yeah, so for me, what was great about bluegrass, like if you listen to Flatten Scruggs in particular, that's great, like maybe the Carnegie Hall album or something yep. like that, and you hear the music, um, slows down a little bit on the choruses or he'll stops playing the banjo he comes in and sings the baritone and they slow down and then the fiddle comes in they come back in for the solo and it all picks up like everyone's got incredible time but it's not metronomic yeah and so for me i prize great listening more than actual metronomicness and a great way to become a great listener is to practice with a metronome because you're you're trusting it to be your beat yeah but if you get stuck like hey you know, it fell backward a little bit here or it pushed here a little and that's no good, well then you're missing some important things about music because music is a living, breathing thing and it's yeah. not a metronome. But I mean, great drummers obviously can be that, but yeah. it doesn't have to be like that to be good. Yeah. It can be good. 
or it can be perfect and bad. You know sure. what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. So, uh, but uh, what happened in Bluegrass is guys like Sam Bush and Tony Rice came along, and then we made re some records like along the lines of Drive, where the playing uh, was so was was pretty darn metronomic, although none of it was recorded with a click. The, the just the the time feel was so so incredible that everybody had. Yeah. That stuff stuff had this mm, this you know almost shaking. It was so in time. Yeah. And that was ability. You know, nobody was playing to a click or anything. Yeah. Um, and some of that stuff picked up a bit, and it was fine. So what happened is, is in the years that people started to copy those kinds of bands, like um, the Tony Rice records and um, Sam, people like that, they took that rhythmic thing almost out of context and said, oh, well, it's got to be like this, because those guys play like that. And everybody started recording bluegrass records with drum machines and then turning off the drum machine, you know, using it to make sure that everything's yeah. locked in and not listening to each other. Mm. And so to me, I've had a lot of conversations with Edgar Meyer about this, like, why is Yo-Yo Ma such a great player? Because he's such a good listener. Um, and he's used, like, great classical players are used to the tempo moving all different kind of ways and having to be a master of a moving tempo yeah. because they have to be a great listener, mm -hmm. you know? And there's all kinds of speed ups and slow downs and tiny variations yeah. written to the music that you really have to understand. It's a lot deeper than just, here's the click, stay in that groove. Yeah. Now, Pat Metheny, he likes a click, but he likes it to speed up. You know mm. about that, right? So because he no, feels I like don't. natural music should pick up. It's natural. You're excited. It should move, but it should move in a consistent way. So he uses so a progressive a, click. A progressive click that he would use on tour. He used to play with it live all the time Are you with the Pat Metheny group. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it kind of drove the the drummer a little crazy. I know. Wow. I, I, I heard stories. You know, it was like you had to put on the headphones, and you know, it was like a rock, like these shows. Yeah, yeah. Not a rock, but like a pop show where the you know you press play and the show starts, and you better stay on. Yeah. With the sequencer. You yeah. Know? So it was kind of like that a little bit. And and but what it gave him was an extremely consistent concert. Yeah. And he could really play. He felt very comfortable with yeah. the way the tempo was moving and what was wow. happening. Wow. That bit, really surprises me. Yeah. I've never heard of anybody. Actually, programming the click to. Oh yeah, you can. You can. A lot of clicks have that. Yeah, in yeah, them now. yeah. I know that that yeah. exists, but I didn't know like that's what he wanted. Yeah. In his show. Yeah. I've played several shows where, you know, the first four songs are sequenced out, and it can be annoying if it's just set up to be stale. Sometimes it can feel like data entry. Yeah. Not that data entry is like a bad like job nobody, or anything, but... But, it, like, nobody's listening to you. They're listening to the sequence in the, yeah, in the yeah. band. Nobody's listening to each other. They're just making sure that they're locked in. And it, it presents as together music. That's, yeah. It's a way to get music together. Yeah. But it's not the game of playing music. Uh, it should be listening yeah. to each other. Musicians should care about what each other are, are yeah. playing and notice yeah. what they're doing and be inspired by when the people around them are doing well. Because I've got... I sat in with a, a, a top, you know, a top pop country band. And I was very surprised that, that when I got out there, it was, here's your headphones and the click's going to come on. And, and I, I felt like nobody in the band was listening to anybody. And it, it was no real reason for me to be really? there. Later on, I saw them play on TV and I heard my banjo parts come on on the television show ah! that I had done on the record. You know what I mean? So the weird Call thing, the union! The weird thing for me on that one was on the record, it sounded like the right tempo, but live it sounded slow. Yeah, like yeah, they yeah. did the record tempo so yeah. they could use the, the tracks from the album. Yeah live and um i was really surprised but uh but it, live tempos should be different so yeah. you should have you know a variety certain, of certain songs yeah, yeah. some it, some it songs needs... or where it falls in the set a, t a song might need totally. to be slower or faster than the yeah. record so i don't know all that stuff is matters to some of us yeah yeah i think there's a way to do it musically though Absolutely. playing along to to those things but yeah. like you're saying it has to be built in to the program it has yeah. to be built into the camp that you're in this is our guideline. We're going to play musically within it. Right. But this is keeping us on because like, maybe it's synced up to a video thing. Right. And exactly. that's cool. Well, that was one of the main reasons is because it, cause it's synced up to all the lighting and all the camera work, which is a button somebody presses that starts yeah. the show. And then they don't have to do all this. Nobody has to like monitor the lights like a freak, you know, because it all, it all happens. Yeah, and then there's a screen with all these videos happening yeah. behind that are all timed down to the second. And, you know, if you change the tempo of the song, none of that yeah. stuff's going to work anymore. So it depends what you're trying to achieve. I mean, it's a different yeah. game. And Chick Corea yeah, yeah, totally. always talked about it as a different game. Like, what game are we playing here? Yeah. What's our game? If our game is uh, we're going to look at each other and see what we can come up with, that's one game. Yeah. Another game is to turn on a metronome and see how tight we can play with it. Yeah. You know, and how we can make great music with that limitation. Yeah. It's all, you know, it's all good. I definitely did a lot of playing with a metronome. Because I knew I was going to do a lot of metronome playing just growing up that way. One thing I always 
my teachers always inspired me to do was make the metronome sound like it grooves. Yes. And then it doesn't have to sound stale. Right. It doesn't have to feel like, all right, data entry, we're all just playing to the groove and none of us, or to the click and yeah. nobody's paying attention to each other. Yeah. If you build that in, yeah. it can actually feel really nice. Yeah. And almost, to me in some ways, I actually have a, a, a deeper sense of freedom a lot of times when I play with the click because it's one less thing. You don't have to hold the thing together. Yes. Right, you can, you can, you can relax a little bit, yeah. I get that. But it, it, it's, I, ha I had to take a journey to get to that level of yeah. playing well, on the I grid. played with a click a lot. When I practice, I like to play with the click, and it makes my playing better. But yeah. it also makes me a better listener. Yeah. But I don't space out with the click on. I focus yeah. on it as if I'm playing with Tony Rice or Sam Bush or Chris Thiele. You know, I, yeah. I listen to it, and I try to lock in like, you can't break us apart. We are so together. Mm -hmm. I sound better. You sound better. You know, that's what I try to do. A lot of people, I say, you know, I play with the, the metronome all the time. And I'm saying, well, let me hear you play with it. And they're just like, they're not with it. It's yeah. just on. It will do a little bit of work for you by having it on, keeping yeah. you from like totally. But if you don't focus on it, like as if it's the most important thing on the world, then it won't really get you anywhere. But I'm not opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> you never struck me as that. <laughs> okay, speaking of having opinions, I want to ask about sometimes you're in duo settings and it's you're just back and forth and like us playing together. Oh, do you like this? Yeah, cool, whatever. You know, we're we're both just kind of down. It was a fun yeah. environment. Yeah, that was a great. I loved it. In certain band settings, you have strong personalities. You have strong... Yeah. It's the armadillo. I think he dumped his tank on us. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna land in a second. So you have people with strong personalities, people with strong musical presence. How do you as a band leader and as somebody who has a very strong presence yourself navigate and negotiate that? I guess I'm thinking mostly the flectones. Yeah. And, and how that band environment adjusts, you know, yeah. from Howard to Jeff. I just got along so well with Victor and Future Man. Everything was so easy. And Richard, the sound man. Yeah. Um, and Howard, too. Um, we just never really had a bad word. Um, in a way, it didn't teach us too well what to do when we did have a problem. You know, like, <laughs> you know, when you're in a relationship yeah. with someone, everything's so great, and for years, and then all of a sudden something comes up, you don't have the tools to work things through. Sure. But um, generally, my thought is if the people are really, really talented, like way better at me at a lot of things, like yeah. in the flectones, like I'm good at what I'm, they can't do what I do, but I can't do what they do. I try everything I can do to not ask for anything. Like, mm. just leave them, everyone alone to do their thing. Um, and, and of course, I am telling them to do things, but me trying not to do it at all means that I don't do it enough to piss them off. <laughs> I yeah. try and save it for something that really matters. Yeah. So the times that, only times I remember having trouble with the flectones personally were, you know, making records, because that was the time when it really counted. That was like, that's when I got more vocal. Yeah. Because uh, if, if it wasn't going to end up right, that wasn't the time, well, yeah, you know, it could be that way tonight, fine, or, or at rehearsal, I'm yeah, like, yeah. Well, hey, whatever, you know, it's great. You, this isn't, I'm, I can't, can't believe I'm in the band with you guys, great. But on the record, that was like, well, usually my tune, I had a concept I was hoping for, I had a lot of things I'd been thinking about, everybody else was thinking about what they were thinking about, I was like, no, I really want to get this part, you know, I really, can we really, you know, and and get kind of dogmatic and really push for it because it felt like this was when it really mattered. Yeah. And that was the only time I remember having like a falling out in the flectones. Like mm -hmm. it, was, it was me and Roy. It's long over and I don't even know if he remembers it, but I remember feeling sure. horrified about the whole thing. And uh, we, you know, it ended, it was a bad end to the record because I just was really fighting to get the stuff to sound a certain way. Generally, I didn't have to, but once in a blue moon, I, I just learned that as little as possible was better. Yeah. Do you still feel yeah. as strong now listening back to that song as when you did? Oh, I don't remember now. I mean, I don't even remember what it was about. But I'm, you know, there was certainly, you know, in most band leaders would have some opinions about the drumming, but me not really being around drumming much at that point, I really didn't, I, I didn't feel like I should be saying very much to as a guy. who went to high school with Omar Akeem and Kenny yeah, Washington. But yeah, but I was playing banjo. <laughs> I didn't know anything about it. But I'm, here I am with Future Man, who's a, you know, bona fide genius drummer. Yeah. With, a, you know, so much, but that doesn't mean he's going to be able to always read my mind. Sure. You know, so there were occasionally times when I just really wanted a kick drum in a spot or mm. I heard the snare here or whatever. And so, in, again, the record is the only time I would ever say it because yeah. generally what, what he did was better than I could have ever asked him to do. But there were certainly a few things every once in a while. But even when I arranging the tunes, I tried to shut up because I always knew what I thought the song should be. 
Um, and it, it would generally get there without me saying anything. But if it didn't, I could always remember, I really think that's an F chord. But if I didn't say anything, Victor might come up with a whole different approach to it. And all we yeah. would do is sit in a room and play until we all thought we were good. And when we all thought we were good, we were good. We had something good. And everybody had ownership in their parts. It wasn't like, yeah. I said, no, Victor, you got to... I came up with this on the sequencer and the bass part goes do 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 No, I never did that with him. I never yeah. told him what but or or future man, almost almost never. Yeah. But um because they would come up with something way better and it was way hipper and they owned it. When we went out on tour yeah. they were playing their parts, not yeah. my parts. But every once in a while I would like write a piece that had like three lines that all had to be played exactly as written. Yeah. And those were the times when I might be, you know, let's really get this right. The only reason why I ask about the do you still feel the same way now is because I'll listen to I just listened to an album that I did last year and I was you know you, you listen to music differently when you're in the mixing yeah. phase and then when you're just in the enjoying the music phase yeah and I was listening back because we were hearing something we were rehearsing something and we need oh what was it that we did on the album yeah and I listened back I thought I can't believe I fought for this mix decision she was right yeah I was wrong well. Now when I'm out of context, I can't believe I, I I was like in a different mindset, you know. So yeah, sometimes I I have to force myself to listen to my own music in a different way, where it's not just am I analyzing the mix? Yeah. Is it am I just enjoying this right thing as a whole? Yeah. But there's a couple of things that happen there, and one of them is that you um, because you uh, use your strength to fight for your mix idea. Now you're stuck with doubt. So now this listening, when you went back, you heard it and you heard the other person's point of view. That doesn't mean your original point of view was right or wrong. It just means now you're prepared to hear the other, the other view. Mm. And so now, now you can get down on yourself and go, gosh, you know, why did I fight theirs is better? Now you might go back, you know, five years from now and go, you know what, it really, it's okay. What I came yeah. up was really good. It might not have been worth fighting about, but it, it was good yeah. too. So I find that your perception really changes as time goes by. And there's a statute of limitations too. Like all the hell and worry and angst like of a show that you did yesterday, hearing it today, hearing it five years from now, all that stuff goes away and you can just enjoy it as music. And albums are like that for me. When I hear the records I made, it's, there's a limitation. It has to get back on the calendar to a certain point. Yeah. And then I can just go, yeah, okay. And I don't care about that little push or pull or that, you know, click or whatever, you know, or bad yeah. mix move. Or... When you listen back to your catalog or think back on your catalog, is there any one particular tune or album where you think, I, I should have done better or I could have done better? Well, again, perception is the big thing here. There was a song on Flight, on the Co Flight of the Cosmic Hippo that we did called Turtle Rock. And Turtle Rock was like a, a rock song with distortion. Yeah. And it really, on some level, it was an attempt, you know, to get a hit. Mm. You know, and, I, and so for years, I regretted that. We made a video, nobody cared about it, it didn't go well, you know. And so I decided that that was a piece of crap and that we never should have done that because we didn't need to be that kind of band. We were, you know, you know, it was lame, you know. And so I decided that that song sucked for many, 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 many years. <laughs> And then I went back to it and I heard it one day. I was trying to think, well, what are we going to do on this new tour that we haven't done for a while? And I pulled it up and just gave it a second. I was like, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. So it's a cool song. In fact, there's some really cool things in it that I was able to appreciate. And maybe I suddenly liked it because for so many years I had decided it sucked. Mm. So I was able to go hear it. Well, does it really suck? You know, and I yeah. went back and, no, it doesn't suck. It's okay. So, you know, all these things seem much more important than maybe yeah. they are because, you know, it's how much music gets recorded over the over the years and how how can every track matter you know it, it matters to you but it, it yeah you know maybe the few people that you get that follow you into your into your whole catalog that really care about your music in a deep deep way they may have strong opinions and argue about this or that but yeah they take what they get and they're glad to get it really yeah, totally you know See, like I, I am from my favorite artist they I'm happy to get their new stuff you know I'm not I'm not yeah. sitting there tearing them to shreds yeah me too yeah. I, I wrestle with the like you're saying you you try to write a hit song and you, you try to go after your purest artistic pursuit. And sometimes those things align. Yeah. Like part of my artistic pursuit is wanting to write the best song that will attract the masses yeah. or whatever. But I do find that whenever I try to force something that doesn't feel like my real artistic pursuit in the moment, sometimes I'll take a song all the way to the finish line 
get it mastered. It's like track number seven. Yeah. And then right before I'm about to upload it, literally, like, the second I'm uploading it online, thinking, no, I can't do it. Yeah. And then I'll, 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 I'll pull it out. Now, now it just sits on my hard drive. Well, those are the ones that you regret. Are the ones where you try, where you where you ha- were going at it for the wrong reason. Yeah. There's this one song on uh, me and Abby's last record. It sounded a little bit like uh, uh, Coldplay, hmm. just a little bit. And I was like a cheerleader of this song because I thought, you know what, this song really sounds like a pop song on two banjos. It sounds like people would hear it and go, hey, this fits, you know, on a record. On a, yeah. I thought maybe, you know, maybe we'll get some attention with this. It was such a struggle to get this track, and it was like trying to get the vocal was just such a pain. And she's a great singer; it wasn't flowing. And we finally got it, you know, and and got it, you know, really good. And for a while, we were convinced that we really had something, you know, that was going to help the record and help us get our our duo, yeah, out there. But the truth is we never could play the song. We, it was a battle the whole way to get it down, and nobody yeah. even seemed to notice the song. I mean, I think really? one person that has ever mentioned that song to me. So I think usually when it's that hard, it's not meant to be. I mean, not that you should only do things that are easy. You yeah, should totally. be always be pushing yeah. and trying to do things that are hard because it makes you a better musician, and you never know what you'll find. Yeah. But sometimes there are things, and I'm mean, usually not good at figuring it out because I become a cheerleader for a song. They get to a certain point that where we're recording. I'm like, I've got to believe. I'm believing in this thing. Yeah. And Victor said, I never thought that Ho Down was going to be a good song for the Flectones. You know, this, really? Yeah, he was like, I never. And, but once he heard the recording, after we made the recording, he said, well, I was wrong about that one. And yeah. I was like having to like push, the, push it up the hill you know, to try and get everybody to do it at the yeah. time. But, but no, they got into it, you know, but they just didn't think, they didn't hear what I was hearing. And I was, of course, hearing Emerson, Lake, and Palmer and a huge hit that they had on it when I was a that's, kid. That's your inspiration for that? Well, it was that and also hearing the orchestra play it in my high school and just loving the, wow. you know, loving that tune. Yeah. And wanting to know how to play it because I just liked it a lot. But so yeah. between the two of those, I had this image of it as being a song that would really turn people on that I just loved. Yeah. So anyway, Victor didn't quite get it, but then eventually he, he got way, be, way behind it. And it was a strong song for the Flectones there for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, on the flip side, is there a certain song where you really feel like, this is my magnum opus? You feel like you've written that or recorded <laughs> that song or written that thing that you feel like, this is my Mona Lisa. Hmm. Do you feel like you have that? Probably I would go back to Drive. You yeah. know, a drive or strength in numbers or some of those things. Some of the concertos, like the first concerto and the second concerto, there were things about that that I felt like I wasn't going to do any better. I'm playing with Chick, you know, there were things that happened there. The live album that nobody gave a darn about to me is, you know, so much, yeah. such a quantum leap. And then we have this other album in the can that will come out someday that is better than anything we've ever done that I'm so proud of. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And um, we, we were working, we were doing these pandemic uh, tracks and we were doing live. We really? did a bunch of live stuff. Yeah, we did like um, we had eleven new live tunes on the last tours. We recorded all the shows, and at the end of it, I said, "We need to go to your house and record this stuff," you know. And he said, "We just did." He said, <laughs> "I may I hear my I, I hear nominate you to be the producer. Go find the stuff on these, you know, because he felt like he wasn't gonna do it any better than he did it live." Sure. So I was like, "Oh man, now it's all in my lap." And I went. Sure enough, he was right, and it was some fabulous versions of all of these new songs and then he started sending me tunes during the pandemic he said i'm bored here's i wrote this tune you know let's let's make a track out of it you know and so yeah. we did i think three or four real you know involved duo tunes that maybe we would never have done as well in the studio yeah but because it was you know us taking our time separately and then he sent me all these improvs that i then did improvs or wrote pieces to go with so it's a quite a, a deep album full of things that of course you know We'll never play again, but at least I have the satisfaction that that group, that duo, got to the next level before it yeah. had to end. As a friend, as a person, as a musician, as a, a partner on the bandstand and, and in an artistic pursuit, where do you go from that, knowing that this this person has passed away? And that's tough. Yeah, it was. It's been a, it's been the hardest. The Tony Rice too. You know, but yeah. losing Tony and Chick in the same year. In fact, I'm dedicating this album to both of them. This new bluegrass album, which, you know, Chick had a record called My Spanish Heart. And you always think about Chick having this incredible Spanish aspect to his playing, but he was Italian. You know, and I'm a, I'm a bluegrass musician, but I'm from New York City. I have no connection. So in a way, I, so I said, how do you feel about me using the title My Bluegrass Heart for this record? I asked him, <laughs> he said, go for it, man. Great. Why not? So for me... Um, he's been a big inspiration in a lot of ways, you know, finding his center outside of his natural 
place. You know, outside of jazz, he found the Spanish yeah. thing. For me, bluegrass certainly shouldn't be my natural place, but it is. It's everything that I do comes out of it. The loss of not, you know, not being able to call Chick up and say, uh, "Hey, check this. Out. I'm working on something. Would you, you want to check it out?" Because he was always the, he always loved anything you sent. He would always mm -hmm. he was a great guy to listen to something because he would never listen to it and say. Yeah, you need to work on the timing on the third chorus. He'd be like, yeah, man, it's a work of art. It's genius. He, mm. he would just always say it, whatever you sent him. So I miss sharing things with him, and I miss the energy that he could, the things he could pull out of me, you know, because that's never going to happen again like that. You know? Yeah. And Tony Rice, too, the way he could make a bluegrass band play, the way he could make the banjo player play from the guitar seat mm. was just such a gas. Yeah. And I'll never get to feel it like that again. None of the new people, as great as they are, you know, Billy Strings, Brian Sutton, um, Chris Eldred, you know, they, um, none of them could do what Tony could do. And they do things Tony couldn't do. Yeah. But there was something Tony had that was um, just transformative for the yeah. musicians in his band. Not just about how he played, but how he made you play. And Chick had this gamesmanship that everything was fun and that there were no rules and you could do anything at any time. And it wasn't like, hey, where were you on my solo? I needed you. He's like, Sometimes I'd start to solo and he'd just jump on and just start throwing sand in the box, you know? And yeah. Really fun. Yeah. I miss that. I sometimes find myself in musical settings thinking, I am so deeply intertwined with these people right now, especially on tour. Yeah. You know, if we're feeling like I have some of my absolute best friends yeah. that I make music with, I sometimes think, I almost don't want to go any deeper because it's going to just create, it's going to make the loss even greater for when it goes away. But th yeah. it's, that's absurd. Because You're so young. I mean, you've got so well, much yeah, yeah, time. Yeah, yeah you, I know. You, but you have so much fun with your really good friends and make it, you know, and, and you'll take them with you when they're gone too. Yeah. Unless you're the one that's gone. <laughs> but uh, no, you know, you just got to, you just got to enjoy the, enjoy the moments. They'll be over soon enough for yeah. all of us, you know. But, yeah. but playing with people, I, part of me feels like, okay, you know, I'm never going to get to play with the greatest piano player in the world, in my mind, that I love since I was a teenager. I'm never going to have that. There isn't anybody to take his place in the world yeah. for me. I mean, I love Herbie and I love, you know, other great players. Um, but for me, he in particular and Tony Rice were both there before I came into, me, into playing. And so they became, you know, powerful, um, iconic people. And then to get to play with them quite a lot became such an incredible gift to me. Um, so then I started to think, well, wow, you know, that's kind of, I mean, that's the end of my best musical experiences in my life. But that doesn't have to be true either. Absolutely. It's just there's a, the, that mentorship sense of working yeah. with somebody who you go, what do you think? Well, I think the chorus ought to, ought to be like, oh, great, let's do it like that. I'm not like, no, I think we ought to, no. Yeah. You're Chick Corea, you know. I'm sure he got tired of it because he, he liked somebody to push back and, yeah. and, and see some other ideas. But with somebody of his stature and, and older than me. I was like, any decisions you want to make, fine with me. No. Yeah. That's literally exactly how I was feeling when we were just playing. <laughs> oh, wow. Every suggestion you made, I was like, yeah, that's, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's such a process when you're, you're being creative together because you have to, there's a lot of trust and a lot of sort of guesswork everyone's doing to sort of see yeah. where it's going to go and what's going to work. And you have to make a lot of wrong decisions and then correct them or yeah. everything doesn't work. The second song we did, um, when we figured out what part went into what part, yeah, like there were some parts just didn't go into each other properly. Yeah, and when we figured that out, we both knew it. It was like, oh, that works. Yeah, take this line out, just go right to it. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining me. This is really, I'm, I really mean it. You are one of my musical heroes, and I really appreciate you being a part of this. It, yeah. it means a lot to me. Thanks. I'm glad you feel that way. Yeah. <laughs> and I enjoyed playing with you very, very much. Thanks. It sounded great. All right. Yeah. Easy to play with. The best compliment you can, yes! any, I, can I ever get. Huh? Thanks, Bela. <laughs> All right. There you have it. I guess you don't need big sponsors or a bunch of fancy gear to make a compelling piece of art. And you don't need other people to define what success is for you. Because there's a difference between success and fulfillment. Now, I've only been at this music thing for a handful of years, but I have noticed that success is something that other people's perception is of what you do or what's going on around you and fulfillment is something that can only come from you so my suggestion is for those of you that are doing it yourself or doing it with a big team of people no matter what it is try to find something that's authentically you and try to find an authentic expression of who you are as a person 
and the art that you want to make and let it come across in everything that you do. And even if it's not successful, it'll at least be fulfilling. Thanks, Brantley. Where'd they go? Whatever. Two, three, four! Oh.